Uh, well, this is, I, I'm fascinated with this discussion because I think, among other things, often the conversation around what is freedom is very different in um, Europe and in the U.S. Uh, I noticed um, that we now are talking about China being the largest economy in the world um, as Vice President, Dr. Commissioner. We have two doctors in the house for our um, conversation today pointed out. Europe is, in fact, the biggest economy, and I think that it's a very important market for a lot of the people here. It's very important for us to understand how freedom is being debated, regulated, and talked about in these two markets, and what the consequences are of the directions we're seeing. So how we're going to, first of all, let me tell you who we are going to be speaking with and what the format's going to be. We have two incredible disruptors, um, by the way. First, we're going to be hearing from Miriam Meckel, who is the Professor of Corporate Communications and director of the Institute for Media and Communications Management at the University of St. Gallen. She is an incredible thought leader in Europe. We're very lucky to have her here, and she's been very, I think, provocative in laying the ground um, for these conversations. So we'll hear from her first. We also have Dr. Um, Vivian Redding, who is Vice President of the European Commission, um, EU Commissioner for Justice, Citizenship, and Fundamental Rights. She's been an incredible innovator on everything from um, putting women on boards to actually establishing the framework for, I think, freedom and trust and human rights in Europe. And she's also in the middle of an election campaign, so she's taking time out to come for this. So first, I'd like to call Miriam up. She's going to um, give us a brief presentation, talk a little bit about the scene, and then we're going to have a conversation with the three of us. So um, stay tuned. So Miriam, come on up and uh, tell us what's going on in Europe. Good morning, everybody. So I'm, I'm European, I'm German. I live in Switzerland, and I'm sorry for none of it, but I hope I can, can, I can get across some, some uh, insight on how we're debating uh, the stuff we have already started to talk about. And for that, I would like to start with introducing somebody to you. Um, I guess only very few of you will have known in person. Maybe none of you will, may, will have known in person, but uh, you all know that guy as to the fact that he was one of the former presidents of the United States. Um, it's uh, Dwight Eisenhower I want to introduce to you, and uh, he's known by a lot of things. He's known as a military person, he's known as a five-star general, he's known as the president of the United States from 1953 to 1961. And in his farewell address, when leaving the White House on the 17th of January in 1961, he coined a very specific uh, phrase, and that was one uh, that uh, stuck to the minds of the people, and I want to remind you of that one today, because he was talking about the military-industrial complex we all need to be uh, aware of. So you might think what she's coming across with this old guy and this old uh, quote. I, I would like to dive a little bit into that and tell you what, I, what, what came to my mind while reading the whole speech. There is something in it that in a way evokes the idea for an adaption to today's situation. And if you want to make this clear in your mind, I would highly recommend for those who haven't done that yet to read the novel by Dave Eggers, The Circle. Because that's the version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 of the military-industrial complex Eisenhower was pointing us to. And the funny thing is, or the less funny thing is, that a lot of things, a lot of structures Eisenhower was pointing out in his speech, 1961, can be reconsidered looking at uh, Dave Egger's idea of the circle and something I would call today the military-corporate information complex. Same structures, same background, same procedures of development in a way, but different features. So the military corporate information complex is non-material in the first place. It's, most of its parts are non-observable and it's extremely convenient for all of us because it serves everything we have ever liked, everything we've ever been looking for and wanted. 
that's what this is about. And what I would like to, to point at a little bit are three like uh, parts of crash barriers, I'd like to call them, um, that might describe what we are um, uh, aiming at and going through. So uh, this military corporate information complex is moving and uh, the debate in Europe is moving on uh, regarding these different developments between those crash barriers. The first one is the transparent and the accountable. So, I guess we all agree upon the fact that transparency has become a real buzzword. It has become something like the philosophy, maybe even the ideology of uh, our networked world or even of the military corporate information complex I'm talking about. Is transparency a value by itself, a democratic, a liberal value, particularly on the internet? My answer to that question is no, it isn't. It is a value as a means to an end, and that end is accountability, not total transparency. So democracies care for their governments and institutions to be accountable to their citizens, their members. They don't take care about uh, surveying them uh, for the sake of something like total transparency. To understand this a little bit Better, I would like to point out a quote by Donald Rumsfeld, you've all heard about that, and it's addressing the operational code of something I would call total transparency. We are discussing and debating about in Europe kind of a lot. And this uh, quote is the quote about the unknown unknown, you know that. I guess aiming at the unknown unknown is aiming at something like all embracing transparency and that's what uh, this wants to leverage it wants to leverage knowing about something that uh, hasn't really come up knowing about thoughts that haven't been really thought and knowing about maybe deeds that haven't really been done up to the point you try to figure them out so the unknown unknown is always something you establish to create something like a perfect information dictatorship and it has it has nothing to do with uh, what I think is important in this regard which is accountability let's look at the second um, like uh, dichotomy uh, or axis uh, we have to keep in mind and this is the civil and the corporatist the Economist recently ran a pretty interesting story on Google becoming the new General Electric um, and they argued in a way that they said it's step by step developing in that direction. Google taking over Motorola Mobile in 2011, taking over uh, Boston Dynamics Robotics in 2013, now Nest Labs in this year. And what they do, the economist argues, is that they turn mili military finance technology into something you can adapt for a mass consumer market. And what electricity has been for General Electric kind of uh, a few years ago, data is today for Google. That's the mechanism, the economist, the economist uh, liberal newspaper has pointed out uh, a few weeks ago. Third um, dichotomy or a third pair of axes I would like to point out uh, for this um, military corporate information complex I'm provocatively talking about is uh, the axis between patterns and personality. Why do those changes I've been starting to describe come along so rather easy these days? I guess it has to do with the fact that some kind of change has taken place or has started to take place in the operating system of our social lives. We called that civilization, maybe we still call it civilization, and it is much more than being friendly to each other, being kind and not using uh, the, uh, the respective uh, um, mobile phones while uh, dating for dinner or for drinks or whatever. Civilization is very much about something that is related to individual autonomy, is related to the very fact that a human being exists purposeless. And that means we are all uh, autonomous, we are partly unpredictable, and we sometimes behave randomly. We do not exist just as a means of an end, to an end as humankind. We are not some token on some military playing field and we can't just uh, be used as uh, um, measures or figures for market testing. And that is, by the way, what's great about us as human beings. 
So digitalization and big data bring something else to the table now. Uh, they have introduced another approach based on algorithmic pattern analysis. It's the mathematical or statistical model of something like the system age, I would call it. And it is something that uh, Robert Musil uh, described 1913 in a very interesting essay on the mathematical man as the analogy for the intellectual of the future. And that analogy is very interesting regarding the fact that we are in between those two axes of pattern analysis instead of looking for the individual, the personality, the subjective view on how we want to figure out our world we live in. So particularly this last uh, dichotomy is uh, something we need to figure out uh, because it is non-material in a way, it is non-observable in a way, and it's extremely convenient because those patterns analysis allow us to be served with everything we have ever liked and ever wanted. And therefore, we don't and we won't believe that something might basically change uh, because we just can't observe it. Let me give you an example what I'm talking about here. Think of the Malaysian airline flight MH370. In a time where we can su survey everything, where we have each and every data and information about almost everything, it's inconceivable that an airplane just disappears. But it has happened. And the fact, the very fact that this has happened is something we have to keep in mind. There is something beneath the layer of uh, what we can observe, what we can see, and what we can understand by observing and seeing it. And there, uh, this example shows us it's um, kind of a kind of a uh, interesting development where uh, it can happen that things just disappear, uh, things that are very important for us, and they uh, they disappear in front of our eyes. And by the way, not only airplanes. So who is uh, supposed to, to take a look at that we safeguard the Internet as a space for a civilized life, a democratic life, for grassroots movements, for entrepreneurship and innovation, and not just the one taking place in the big corporate environments? Who's going to be setting the framework for the future globally digitized world we live in? Is it Mr. Erdogan in Turkey? Is it the Chinese Communist Party? Is it King Abdullah of, of Saudi Arabia? Is it the intelligence services? Is it Vladimir P Putin from his new headquarters in Ukraine? I guess not. So that's something where Europe and the US could and should join forces. They haven't really done a good job about that uh, recently, but I think there's something to talk about in this regard. And it's not only about institutions, it's somehow about us all. It's not just being calm and a good digital citizen, like taking part, um, going into the mainstream acceleration of a development that's pretty easy and very, very convenient. It's about realizing that we have a choice between different tracks. We can figure out how to develop the Internet as a civilized, a free information space, a realm of living in a networked society. We have enough central intelligence operators, we need more citizens' intelligence activism. And by the way, this is what Dwight Eisenhower knew already. He said, an alert and knowledgeable citizenry is needed for security and liberty. That's something to keep in mind even as of today. Thanks very much for your attention. I, I want to start by just mentioning, you uh, quoted Eisenhower, so I feel compelled to go to another American president, um, which was Reagan, and just say uh, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That is a very American way of viewing things, which is, I would happily sell my child for a seat upgrade on American Airlines, but I don't even want the IRS to know my um, street address. So. Uh, Vivian, you're here from the government, so how exactly are you helping situations? And tell us, first of all, um, what is happening in Europe, and then we can get to the wider discussion around the freedom in both uh, the entire world, in fact. I don't think we can balkanize it the way some have tried to. Well, your quote of uh, Ronald Reagan actually shows what are the differences between the United States and Europe. In Europe, people would say, thanks God there is a government. 
to make the laws to protect us against government and against the economy. <laughs> Uh, and, Some um, would say we have no government right now, but that's a whole other... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I do not want to mix into this, but you see also the basis of how data is uh, uh, controlled or how data is handled between uh, the European Union and uh, the uh, United States. Uh, it, it can be given in one slogan. Um, in the United States, you can process unless it is forbidden, and in Europe you can process only if it is allowed. And that is a very big uh, difference uh, between the two. And there is another difference which is uh, enormous, and that is uh, we have our Bill of Rights in Europe, it's a Charter of Fundamental Rights, and in its Article 8 this Charter stipulates that the personal data belong to a person and to nobody else. And this is taken over also by the treaties in between the member states. And that is the reason why we do have federal law on data protection. For us, data protection as a fundamental uh, right is a basic achievement of civil rights in Europe. And from that on, you have to understand the behavior uh, in society, in government, and uh, in economy. Uh, so you see, there I already hinted to the fundamental differences which are between the two continents. By the way, there is no federal law on data protection in the United States. There have been efforts. Obviously, we've had uh, we've been a little less effective in passing some of the laws. Um, I'm curious. We should add, we will get to why you've been effective, but I want to bring Miriam in to just um, first of all give us your sense of the situation in terms of the difference between the two countries. Because when a lot of Americans, when you hear that um, the situation you put in place. That sounds, we much prefer sometimes to ask forgiveness than permission. And some people would argue it actually impedes innovation when you have too many privacy laws in place. It makes it harder to be entrepreneurial. Do you think that's the case? I mean, give us a sense of what you see as the difference in terms of the freedom of the internet in these two places. I don't think it's necessarily harder. I mean, Vivian just pointed out very, very clearly where the differences are. But first of all, I think differences are not a bad thing. Differences are a good thing because whenever you have a difference, you can learn from from the perspective and you can make something out of it. If everything is similar, it's just uh, um, the, the start of laziness, and and uh, uh, that's that's not helpful. What what I think is necessary is that you start to communicate in a way. That's relevant for European co uh, companies uh, trying to, to make their efforts in the US market, but also vice versa. I'll give you an example. We had a huge debate in, in the German market about Amazon. Amazon, um, Germany is the second largest uh, market in the world. Uh, they had labor disputes uh, bec because of uh, uh, assumed bad working conditions and a huge media debate. It took the, the headquarters of Amazon almost two weeks to understand at least that they need to start communicating. And that's something that's uh, unnecessary because if you want to make have business, if you want to start business and, and, and thrive in your business, you need to communicate and you need to take into account cultural differences. All over the world, by the way, if you start to um, uh, have your business in, in, in South America or in, in, in Asia, you need to, to need to take account of the cultural differences as well. Does that reflect to some way, does that reflect back on, you think, the, the freedom? I mean, give me a sense. U.S. companies now find it, we've seen statistics, now find it more difficult to operate. In Europe, it's, it's a trust issue to a large extent. What do you see going on and to what extent I is it also reflected in the regulatory environment and not understanding what's going on? Well, the Snowden affair has been uh, a confirmation to European citizens that you should not trust. Um, even before the Snowden affair, 70% of the Europeans are aware of the opinion that uh, their personal data is misused by the companies. They tend to trust government because they know our laws are very strict so that governments, they are somehow okay, but only somehow. But companies are not okay at all. So what was the reaction 
after Snowden. It was simply, do not entrust your data anymore to an American company. Uh, the result of this is that the, the income pattern uh, has gone down by 25% in Europe for the American companies. And the analysis also says that um, cloud computing uh, is going to have a less development in Europe, which will be less income of roughly 30 billion euros until 2016. The reaction of European and American companies in order to answer to this is to build cloud computing in Europe mm -hmm. uh, and to say this cloud is secure. Uh, are they right? Here. Are they right when you've got a German well, cloud um, and a Belgian cloud? And I mean, is that well, a development we, we want? We risk to be to get a balkanization yeah. of the cloud industry, which I think is not a good thing. And that is why I have always been pleading. Uh, what you said, you have to understand the cultural diversity before you do business. That's basic. That's absolutely basic. And I personally do believe that uh, data protection is a business argument. Um, if you are capable to offer to your um, companies, uh, to your um, uh, customers, a safe environment, well, they are going to buy into it. So uh, there is a real um, capacity uh, to build a company on the basis of offering data protection and cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. There is a whole world of business you can do outside there, and you get a, a, an advantage if you consider that people are not thinking the same everywhere in the world. If I were... Uh head of communication of the European Association of IT Industry, I would give the marketing uh, award for 2015 to Edward Snowden. Because so you think of Snowden as a hero? Uh, I mean, he has boosted European IT industry and security. He's a hero to European photography IT. And, and stuff. In a way, that's, that's un incredible. It's a rise. We have a, have a Swiss uh, competitor to WhatsApp that has like, like uh, 30 times uh, as much uh, as many customers. So, so the reaction against the American companies has been very good for European innovation. In that's so now, yes. do you think, of, uh, do you think Snowden's a hero? No, Snowden is a wake up call. So how would you characterize him? I mean, uh, besides well, a wake-up call, do you think well, that... Well, I, I, I do not think we should now speak a lot about... You're in an election campaign, so we're... <laughs> No, I'm not in an election campaign, know, thanks know, God, I here. I know. That's why I escaped now for two days, <laughs> to open my mind and not to be in an election campaign. No, no but no, okay. so tell me, but it, it gets to a good point, which is you have been coming to Washington for, for you know, several years, I'm sure, talking about these issues. What Give us a sense from the front lines of, of the conversations you have there and yeah. what you see as... Um, you know, the will versus the actual ability to do anything about these issues in this country? Well, President Obama has had, after the Snowden affairs, some very important speeches where he said the right things and where he put uh, in front a to-do list. Uh, the problem is that between the speech and the action, there is a very big gap. And the uh, president also has a very big problem, and so has um, uh, Eric Holder, who is my counterpart here in the United States. And we are now, since uh, two years, uh, negotiating a bilateral agreement uh, on uh, law enforcement and uh, data protection, uh, where simply Eric cannot go the, f the step he needs to do because he doesn't have a Congress which votes the laws he needs. Whereas I do have a European Parliament, a freely elected European Parliament, who is not so much under the domination of uh, corporate money as, um, uh, as in this part of the world. So the Parliament helps me and votes the laws I am asking the so Parliament So you think the lobbyists have a vested interest in, in stopping these sorts of regulations from happening? What would be the big corporate money that would not want to see... Well, all the big companies in Europe, for instance, who do not apply European law in this moment do not like what I am doing. Because I am doing two things. Uh, first, uh, I unite a whole continent which is already today the biggest economy in the world, if you take the 28 nations uh, together. And um, I get rid of the barriers uh, so that 
industries have an easier access because when you have this continent and this wealth and the biggest economy of the world, you must get rid of the barriers which are still hampering uh, the business. So this I do. But on the other hand, I say, you have a gold mine under your, at your disposal under the condition that you obey to European law. And the fact that I must say that I think that's shocking. Imagine I come here to the United States and I don't obey to American law. What would happen to me? You would put me in jail. Okay, the right thing to do. What do we do so far in Europe? We do as if nothing has happened. And I like to change that. Open the market, but a level playing field for all companies, for our European companies and for the American companies. And each company which works on the European soil has to apply the European law, as simple as that. So what, what is that? Um, give us a taste of, of ideally what's going to change, because we've seen certainly a lot happening even in recent weeks around divergent paths on network neutrality, a lot of different areas where you know, you're seeing different directions. What it will we be talking about this time next year? How do you want the legal landscape to change if you could wave a wand and... If, if, if I would be the Vice President of the United yeah, States? Yeah, both and tell us some insight <laughs> into what's happening yeah. in Europe too. Yes, so now you're, pre you're in the US, what... If I, if I had a wish, uh, it was that um, the government has the power to do what it says it wants to do. And not only uh, the power to believe they actually want to do what they say they want to do? Yes, I do believe, but sometimes in order to apply what you want to do, if you cannot do it with a presidential order only, uh, if you need a law, then everything is blocked because the Congress doesn't vote uh, the laws which the government would need. And that is very, very difficult. Also, if you are negotiating, you see, because if I'm negotiating with somebody and we come to ends, and uh, then I go to my parliament, I ask for my parliament to apply what I have negotiated, and that's not always easy to persuade those, uh, um, uh, those uh, freely elected uh, persons to do what I want. So I, I invest a lot in persuading the parliament, in the end the parliament votes, and then the Americans tell to me, yes, but our parliament doesn't want to vote. So why to negotiate? What do you see? Um, what do you see as the consequences of, of whether it's the inaction here or what's happening in Europe? When you look at sort of, is it, it does it is it going to make much difference in terms of just how companies operate? Do you think? I mean, do, I'm just curious if the status quo stays in place. What's the end game? Do you think will we suffer here in the U.S. for not having a policy? Is it naive to think you can have a policy in an era of everybody, you know, the internet of things, the quantified self, can you really stop anybody from collecting your personal information? First of all, I, I think what's, what's going to be suffering is the internet as a free and open marketplace for information. And that's something that's really uh, kind of a revolutionary opportunity, be it business-wise, uh, entrepreneurial-wise, uh, uh, in terms of democracy, uh, communication development, everything. So that would be very sad if that happened. And I alluded to that in my, my little speech, that, that I think if we go back a little bit from the from the day-to-day -day political uh, issues, Vivian Redding has, has uh, mentioned, which are really important, but if we go back a step and ask ourselves, is it so different what in the US and what in Europe we think uh, of as basics for the development of a free and, and, and democratized internet, I would say, no, it's not that different. So please get, let, let's get back to the table and, and talk about this, because there are other parts in the world, I mentioned some of those, where the danger is much bigger than uh, the parts we are in now or uh, talking about Europe. One more uh, remark, if I may, uh, connecting our debate to, to the incredible panel yesterday on neuroscience. We don't need just to, to talk about uh, looking back what might be a problem and might be uh, discussed under pre new preconditions. But if we think of the combination of uh, information technology, computer science and neuroscience, 
what we learned yesterday, and I find it fascinating, I'm really fascinated by the idea of enhancing the human mind. But if we think of having less than a handful corporations dealing with that opportunity as a business model, I really get a little bit scared because there it goes into the, the deepest idea of what humankind and the human being is. And we need to, to have those debates, what we want to strive for and what are the basic non-negotiable ideas of how these developments might take yes, place. Yes, and non-negotiable for us are the fundamental rights. For a example. fundamental rights is not a good, it is not a service, it is a right, full stop. And I'm so proud about the European Court of Justice, because on the basis of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it has started to eliminate all the laws pre-Charter of Fundamental Rights. We have one since 2009 only. So uh, all the laws which have been made before and do not observe the fundamental rights of the European citizens have been abolished by the court. What I think this is very important. Remind people what, what are the fund what are my fundamental rights if I'm in Europe uh, in, in terms of dealing with the internet? Is it just that I am able to con what data am I able well, to control? Just you see, there is another very big difference between the United States and Europe. If you, as an American, come to Europe and you think that your rights to your personal data has been misused, you can go to a European court. If I, European, I come, Google. To, come to America and I presume my rights have been misused, I don't have the right to go to a court. That is again something I'm negotiating with the Americans to have judicial redress the same way for Europeans in America that Americans have them in Europe. Part of the redress is competition, and and you talked about oligopolies. You know the the fact that if you have if it's ruled the fattest, that is a form of losing freedom in itself. That's more of a that's a different issue than personal freedom. That's more about you know, breaking up monopolies and such. And we've certainly seen trouble for companies like Google in Europe. How, how much, where does that factor in for you yeah. as a tool in terms of preserving freedom? Well, that is a general rule of uh, competition and of state aid and so on and so forth, which has nothing to do with the nationality of the company. No. It has to do with the companies operating on European soil. You do have the same somehow in the United States. But also. it has consequences on freedom. No, it has consequences on, on companies which misbehave. It, because it's easier to misbehave, basically when you're well, bigger. Uh, there, there are rules for everybody. And uh, if you want to operate in a civilized world, you have also to uh, abide by the rules of the civilization. Looking at this from the, from the viewpoint of the customer, I'm pretty convinced that, for example, privacy will turn into much more of a business model than it is today. Uh, the NSA scandal is one reason for that, but we, we observe from our research, for example, that people start to get more aware, better aware of what it means, uh, that privacy is reduced, that uh, personal data is stored everywhere without being able to, uh, to get them back, in a way, uh, after having ended the, the corporate or whatever relation and that's something that, that has just started to come to the minds of the people. So there is a lot of uh, uh, business opportunity in taking account of those ideas we have been talking about. Set up about. a non-US subsidiary to not be an American cloud company anymore, not be an American. You know, I mean, how do you deal with, I know time is tight and I want to get to some final thoughts, but I want to ask if you're in the crowd and you are from a US company, you're a US entrepreneur, this is collateral damage for them, that they're getting the impact of just what's in the zeitgeist. What advice do you give to them? Because, you know, maybe they, they don't, they're just feeling a distrust that perhaps is not earned. But you have to restore trust simply. And how? Um, uh, simply on first explaining and showing in practice that you are abiding to the law and uh, also showing to your customers how you do protect uh, your customers. And you can very well do that. There are many American corporations now who are establishing, for instance, their clouds on the European soil, who have uh, all their storage on the European soil and to make it a selling argument. That is exactly what Miriam said. There is a business model which is building up and it is extraordinarily interesting. Okay, so let me ask since time, let's have some final thoughts. It can be 
a haiku, but anything that, that you just want to give in terms of what should we be thinking about, what's on your radar screen, for just help us see around corners on where you see this going right now. And I'm going to start with you, Miriam. Adding on what Vivian has just mentioned, low queue, talk to your customers in Europe, offer a good and flawless service, and what our research uh, shows, um, strive for reciprocity. So you get the data and you give something back for it, and if the See relationship upgrade. is, is uh, done, then the data must be given back in a way. That's pretty easy and not so difficult. Okay, and Vivian, um, some final thoughts, even in terms of what your priorities are. You know what the groundwork is in place. What still remains to be done? What's uh, What would be top of your hit list in terms of US or Europe? <laughs> Two hours later. Uh. No, 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 and you have 15 <laughs> seconds. No, so top, top of my list is simply, to make this continent, which is for me the most beautiful in the world, of course, and Luxembourg, my country, the most beautiful in Europe. Uh, well, visit I'm the going visit tomorrow, the visit I'm Luxembourg. back in, in, in election <laughs> campaign. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, to make this a strong continent, which is confident about its beauties, its rules, and its freedoms, and to make our Europeans uh, proud to be free people, because that is what we are. But free people who count on their government to protect them, and governments to be capable to protect them. Excellent. And, and let's just, we're in New York, final thoughts for the U.S., since we um, are talking U.S. and Europe. Advice to Obama? No, uh, no, no. Uh, advice Eric to... Eric Holder? <laughs> Eric Holder? <laughs> to I, I will see Eric uh, uh, some weeks later, and I will tell Eric uh, what I have to tell him. Now, Which uh, is what? What are you going to uh, tell him? Well, if you are in a negotiation, you do not go to the open space. You go to the open space when you have finished the negotiations. Right. Yes. Uh, I would simply tell to all our American friends who want to do business in Europe, instead of investing millions into lobbying against European laws, invest this money into a new business model which obeys to European laws. And you will see the result will be much better for your income. Excellent. Thank you very much, both of you.